as you create characters, what goes into the process of creating those characters? Well, that depends in part on whether they're going to be known major characters or whether they're going to be secondary characters that make the Okay. When I begin uh, a novel or a series, I put a lot of thought into building the major characters. I think about who they're going to be in terms of the book, and I also think about who they are in terms of how they got to be who they are. If you see what I'm saying. So, for example, if I know that um, Josh Rockland is going to be the nasty, evil Grand Inquisitor in the Sable books, okay, I build a personality for him that has the traits that will cause him to be that person. All right, so it's not going to be your compassionate uh, spiritual counselor type. Okay, he's going to have uh, uh, a vicious temper. He's going to have no sense of empathy. So he sees individuals as things to be manipulated, used, not people to be cared about. Uh, he's going to, despite that, uh, have a, a strong personal belief system, but it'll be a belief system that validates who he is rather than challenging who he is. Um, he's going to, in, in Jasper's case, uh, he's going to be a glut and he's going to be a sensualist, the lecher, you know, and, and all of this goes together to build. And he also has to be, in terms of his own beginning world situation has to be congruent, and he is, in a lot of ways. But he also has uh, uh, an ability to demand that things be the way that he thinks they are, and to ignore evidence that they aren't. Okay? So all of that went into building him when I, when I created the character. And do you know how you want the character to be before you even if he's going to be, if he or she is going to be one of the pivotal characters, then I know how they're going to fit into the story that I want to tell. And knowing how they fit into the story that I want to tell requires them to have certain characteristics. Um, and so then, in turn, the characteristics they have shape the story as it develops. It's, okay. it's not an exclusive process in which to play. Um, for important secondary characters, uh, people who I figure are possibly going to be inserted into the storyline and become more significant characters as we go along, but who aren't in my, in my original Doc Ed Smith, one of, one of his, uh, his, his characters, had this thing he called his visualization of the cosmic all. Okay, that was how he you know, contemplated how the universe was going to work out a million years down the road. It's usually right. But anyway, in my initial visualization of the cosmic all in these novels, I know some characters are going to be significant all the way through. I know some characters are going to have important secondary roles but I don't know how thoroughly they're going to be integrated into the focus story. Okay. And there are other characters who get created as I go along because I need somebody to be the person that Jasper Clinton is screaming at or, or be the person that the position arrests and drags off to the concentration camp. Okay, so you don't start a book knowing not everybody is this character, this character. No, I will start knowing characters that I am using, but I won't start knowing all the characters I will use. Okay. Okay. I see the distinction I make. Okay, well, for the important secondary character, I do kind of uh, Jasper, Clinton, Honor, Harrington, White when I, when I create. Um, I know where they're from, for instance, in Safe and which country they're from. If they're part of the church, I know which uh, which uh, 
religious order they belong to. Um, I know how old they are. I know if they're an adult character, whether or not they're married. Okay, if uh, they're a married couple, um, I usually say they have three kids or whatever, as, or or no children as they go along. So that's all there. It's got it down. For the most part, that is simply so that I don't, on page 17, say they have three children, and on page 374, say they have four. Right. And I have reference that I can go back to to make sure. And that's the same reason why they get hair color and eye color and whatnot. Right? As that character moves through the book and has experiences and interactions with other characters, then the character gets bigger, mm -hmm. okay? And I may create, okay, this character here um, in the honor verse, um, you know, okay, he's an ensign, okay, and he has no siblings, and he graduated from Slavonami Island, the Naval Academy, six months ago, okay? And I'm going along, I decide that I want him to, uh, to be a chess master. Because that's how the scene ends. So I do that. And then I go back to the character list. And I add, and he's a chess master. Okay. okay. And, and that kind of thing. And again, it's so that I can remember what I've done with the character and not later on contradict it. It's also important because let's say that somebody is um, he's uh, exceptionally good at poker. Okay. And then he allows somebody who shouldn't be able to do it to bluff him. Okay? You know, if I know that he's really good at poker, then I can build in that, huh, okay, don't even try it, you know, because of his ability to read bluff. Mm -hmm. By the same token, I don't want somebody later on to say, you know what? In that scene in two books ago, you know, nobody at the table could bluff him, and he was bluff everybody else. And this guy walks through with this threadbare story, and he doesn't even challenge it. Okay, those are the kinds of things that you put notes to yourself in the character description to try and avoid. Um, and you don't always get it in. Okay, you try to, or I try to. Um, and it's easier now that I'm working back and forth between two computers because I can keep character list open on computer A while I'm working on computer B. Mm -hmm. And it makes it easier to do the easier reference the between them. Yeah. It also makes it easier to take notes. I just zip over to the other computer. I use uh, input director. So I can move over to the other computer and um, cut and paste even if I need to from the description in the book when I create a character mm -hmm. and zap it in there. Um, it's important to know what their ages are. And it's also important to cut this out. Uh, if you're going to write a series that spans 20 years or so, it's important to remember when they were the age you gave them. <laughs> you know, it's like, look, this guy's been 25 for 27 years! <laughs> you know, no, that, that's usually not a good idea. And so I will usually know, like, uh, in the Honor Harrington universe, where they're like 19 or 22, those the Eskimos. Okay, so I'll enter, with like, a new character, if you look at her name on that, 135 years old, in... 1922. And that way, I can pick to that anytime I need to go back and say, well, what? He's old. Yeah. Or I, if he's 35 in 1922, I get pretty, pretty sure he wasn't around in like 1894. You know? Um, actually, would have been around 1894. 1874, though, he wouldn't have been. But again, you know, that's one of the reasons why you need to have this information. Mm -hmm. You know? How old is this guy going to be if you go back and do a short story or something said earlier that he is in? Now, sometimes characters who were absolutely, I thought, going to be secondary, I don't know if it was secondary, um, uh, one time only characters, um, take on an importance that I didn't have in mind uh, to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, that's one of the happy coincidences that happens. And then the original characterization gets expanded upon, and frequently 
the expansion comes because of how the character functions in the story. Okay, I need this character to do certain things. Um, and the things that the character is doing then develop and illuminate. So, so you're able to develop characters to fit the story? Yeah. Even once you've established certain... Yeah. And, and one of the advantages of the number of, um, of uh, named minor characters that I have is that they can come back later when they're grown up and become major characters. Um, and there's a sense of continuity for the, for the reader in having watched these characters. Like, um, oh, Scotty Tremaine. Um, uh, Ray Cardona, who is the vet behind the ears, active TAC officer who screws up the deployment of the sensor who is in Basilisk Station, and who in the current book is honoring its flag captain, effectively the senior captain of the entire Grand Fleet, uh, uh, that kind of thing. You know, the readers have seen him mm -hmm. growing. Now, very few of the characters for Fearless in the first novel could be legitimately described as minor characters, the surviving characters, because they're, they've been around for a long time and they're all, all the limited number of survivors are very important to honor. Okay. But at the time, okay, like um, Andreas Venizelos, who became, you know, honors chief of staff and ultimately dies saving her life, okay. Um, we saw relatively little directly of him in Basilisk Station. Now, what we did see was significant, that he was definitely a minor character. And then in the second book, these are XO. 